Hi there, and uh, welcome to the 27th Octoprint on Air uh, broadcast. Um, my name is Gina Heuske. No, there is no B in this name. And uh, I welcome you to this uh, live broadcast if you're watching it live or the recording of it if you're watching this later on, on this uh, very rainy and ugly, weathery uh, Friday evening. Um, yeah, as usual, first a short outline of what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I've been up to. Uh, I'll give you a short uh, overview of what the next steps will be. Then we'll take a look at the stats from the from the um, anonymous usage tracking because yeah, since we had a release that those are a bit more interesting than usual uh, even. And then we'll have our Q and A segment. I have four questions prepared, I think, which were in the backlog. Um, but there will also be, as usual, a live chat. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on desktop, it will be over there. And for those of you who are watching this on mobile, it will be down there. And uh, keep an eye on that. And if there are any questions that come up in there, I will also tackle them in the uh, in the Q&A segment as well. Yep. So uh, what I've been up to. Uh, sadly, way less than I originally wanted. Uh, the problem is that uh, pretty much since the last um, broadcast, I've been more or less constantly sick <laughs> with one cold after the next. So that was a lot of fun um, and still is. But at least as you hear, I can speak again. <laughs> my voice is back. And uh, at least right now, I actually can breathe through my nose. So that's that's definitely, uh, definitely an improvement over uh, the last couple of days. Um, still, uh, I did release one uh, 312 RC3 on September 23rd, and then almost a month later, thanks to the aforementioned cold and also a conference in the middle, uh, one 312 stable. And so far, I have to say the feedback has been very good. Uh, I do not see any major issues. There was one problem with uh, the MMU add-on for Prusa printers. Uh, where if you did not have the printer profile configured correctly to um, state the correct number of extruders, which for an MMU2 is five, 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 five. <laughs> uh, then uh, for some reason it caused weird printer resets or firmware loops or something like that, because then starting with 1312, Octoprint will no longer send two commands to a printer where it does not know that it has this tool. This is to avoid issues with printers who would then run into an endless loop or just crash or something. If they uh, only have one extruder, for example, and then get a T2, and this feature has been in there for a while, it just was buggy. So I fixed this bug in, in 1312. And due to fixing this bug, it unearthed a couple of misconfigured printer profiles around the globe apparently for MMU2 users. So if you have not yet updated to 1.3.12 and have an MMU and MMU2, then please make sure that your printer profile, which you use in Octoprint, actually correctly specifies the number of extruders and then you should not run into any kind of issues. Um, I sadly cannot tell you how uh, this particular configuration problem can lead to printer resets because I could not figure this out. Um, but it seems to be a combination of not getting a tool command within a certain amount of time. And then sometimes that causes the printer to reset and sometimes it just causes the MMU to reset or do a soft reset or it was a really weird situation. Anyhow, there is a solution for it. Just make sure your extruders are correctly specified in a printer profile and all should be fine. Uh, another thing that happened in the last couple of weeks since the last installment of these is there has been a new uh, Octopi release candidate, which is not my work, but what which was actually um, pushed out by Guy Schaeffer. So big thanks to him um, for that, uh, which brings uh, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 compatibility, first and foremost, and also a couple of small bug fixes. And uh, of course, the most recent version of Octoprint and all that. Um, so if you've been waiting, if you've been waiting for an official new version of Octopi and want to test uh, it a bit before it gets released, you still have a chance. I think he wants to release it quite soon, but uh, still, yeah. So that was released on, on uh, or that RC has been out since uh, October 30th. Uh, so yeah, for a bit over a week now, maybe take a look. Um, 
Yeah, and also what I've been doing is uh, working on some more final touches of uh, on 140. Um, expect a uh, release candidate of that out soon. Um, and that actually brings me to the next steps. So the thing is, as you know from my past uh, broadcasts and, and past uh, yeah, Octoprint on airs, and also from my presence on the forums and, and whatnot, um, the original goal was to release 140 stable in 2019 because that will be the release that will be Python 3 compatible and um, Python 2 will go end of life on January the 1st, 2020. So yeah, that was the goal. And then I got sick. So um, I've had to change the goal slightly. So the new goal is to get an RC out ASAP. Uh, make sure that you, you all can, can, can test that and um, see if there are any issues that crept in during the Python 3 conversion or with the new granular permission system, which will be in, in there, or any of the other things that are in there. Um, and um, yeah, what, what it will not include, and I hinted at that already last time, I think, is it will not include a new com layer that I've been working on simply because if I now try to put that in as well, there would be no chance to even get an RC out anymore this year, I fear, because I do not want to release anything after uh, December 10th ish due to um yeah due to to christmas simply looming and uh, i don't want people to run into any kind of problem and then me not being there anymore to help them so i always try to keep at least a two week window until the holidays uh with any any final releases of the year or release candidates of your year for, uh, for octoprint simply so that i have two weeks left in order uh, for 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 fixing any kind of stuff yeah, so RC for uh, RC one for one for out as ASAP, and then I guess we will maybe also see a second one in twenty nineteen, but we will not see a stable one. I would be severely surprised if we saw a stable one. So the goal is to get that out ASAP come January, but uh, I think we all agree that it makes more sense to give this the testing time it needs by uh, a bit of a big, bigger population than uh, what has so far um, been looking at this uh, at this code base uh, instead of trying to rush things now and potentially break setups for people just before Christmas so I think that's not worth it especially not as Python 2 will not stop working on January 1st 2020 it simply will not get any updates after this and yeah, based on what I see in anonymous usage tracking, most people don't update their Python installations anyhow. So yeah, I think it is uh, justifiable <laughs> to say we are not going to rush it out now uh, for any price and just try to um, yeah make it a good release instead. Uh, a release that is going to be pushed as soon as possible again, but still, yeah. It doesn't make sense to try to rush this and I lost pretty much a month of work so yeah okay that being said once this RC goes out I will need a ton of testers um, and uh, if you're currently tracking the maintenance RC branch in Octoprint you will not see this RC because it's a devil RC so I have this distinction between maintenance RCs and devil RCs because devil RCs at least in the beginning can be a bit less stable because they usually contain bigger features bigger changes and all that so um, I wanted to give people the opportunity to say ah maybe that's a bit too tough for me and I just stick to the maintenance stuff um, but I will need testers for the devil RC so if you feel comfortable with Switching to the Devil RC branch, that would be uh, a release channel. Sorry, <laughs> that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, because as, so far we had something like, I think roughly maybe nine hundred or so people, usually testing things on the RCs. Um, I fear we will not hit that number at first, at least for one four zero RC one. It would be nice though if we got a couple of hundred um, because that way there is a bit of, of guarantee that there will be a multitude of printer setups, a multitude of firmware versions that Octoprint runs against um, underlying... Hey, 
I hope I'm still here because my, yeah, uh, all right, my PC just decided to shut off everything for a short period, but that was just a screensaver, thankfully. Um, yeah, multitude of, of basically like this whole, no, I'm not going to say the word that just came to my head. Um, uh, this, this huge, uh, um, very fragmented environment uh, that that Octoprint usually also encounters in the wild when it, with stable versions is, is needs a couple of a couple hundred of 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 RCs uh, RC testers in order to yeah be more or less replicated during the RC testing phase. So if you think you can stomach it and if you feel comfortable in if push comes to shelf to roll stuff back via the command line which by the way you always also should with maintenance rcs but more so with devil rcs then please switch to that um you also get maintenance rcs on the devil rc uh channel in just not the other way around um okay so that was that uh and this is basically yeah this is going to be the next steps uh one other thing that is going to be well more or less a next step uh, should you be in leipzig at the 36 c3 so the chaos communication congress uh, after christmas and before new years uh, i'll be there uh, as well and please say hi if you see me running around so a bit like the chaos communication camp that i went to in august just this time indoors and with more cold outside and very very more uh, very much more people inside like 15,000, I think. So this is going to be, whoa, fun. Um, yeah, okay. So this brings us to a quick look at the stats. I'll just have to quickly switch over to the other screen. There you go. So uh, this is the past 30 days. And uh, so this is pretty much more or less static. The all, all instances overall over time. Um, as you see, the number here is increasing because I think when I started giving you insight into these stats, it was at like 50,000 and now we are already at 58,000. So, hey, it's still growing. And the really fun stuff is down here this time because this is when I released uh, 1312 stable on, uh, on October 22nd. And you can see this is a logarithmic scale, by the way, so don't get confused by that. You can see that people started updating, updating, and of course also the people running uh, one three eleven stable at that point upgraded as well as did the one three twelve RC three R three R three RC three. Now I have it group, and then around uh, November the second dish um, one three twelve took over. And yeah, it's still growing. So I hope at some point this line will go way, way, way down. But as you can see with the 1.3.10 releases, a lot of people simply do not want to upgrade for some reason or another, which I mean, okay, it's fine. But yeah, as long as they don't open tickets about bugs, which have been fixed in the current versions, I'm fine with that more or less. Okay, and you can also see that with the prints that have been uh, running. So the green line is prints run under under 1311 and the yellow is uh, prints run under uh, 1312. Um, uh, Great. Um, and uh, actually not prints, but printed hours. And this little peak here for 1310 is actually, yeah, the expression of a bug because 1310 was not yet doing... Um, how, how do you say, uh, doing, um... so the, the calculation of the duration here does not take into account time shifts, uh, does not take time shifts into account. So if you have like an NTP update that comes in, in the middle, then things like this spike here can happen, which basically translates to 8,000 hours printed within an hour or something, which, yeah, no, this is not going to happen. And, um, or rather getting, uh, being done after that time. So I think, yeah, um, something like that. So these peaks are, are the, re, uh, are the expression of, a, um, of a duration calculation error, which I only found thanks to seeing peaks like this in the graph, which I found quite helpful. Um, another very, very, uh, fun thing that, uh, I can now see and which is especially interesting to plug in authors. Um, with 1.3.12, I added uh, finally um, a daily request that sends the whole list 
of plugins currently installed with the version. So, so far I only could track new plugin installs because I only could track the uh, install events themselves. And with 1312, there's also now this um, Pong event, which, uh, which I called it, how I called it, which I think is set to every 12 hours or something. And um, sorry, this is my <coughs> throat giving me a bit of trouble right now. Um, so the uh, yeah, so now I get a list of um, of all plugins that are currently installed mm. every twelve hours or something like that, or maybe it was twenty four. I'm not entirely sure. Um, still, that allows me to create top twenty plugin lists and. Currently, the absolute top dog is Octolabs with 6,000, 6, almost 6,000, 6,000, holy cow. It's a bit tricky to talk apparently today. Uh, installations, um, and 5k of those are just version 134, and you can see though there are a couple of others which are quite popular. Um, and yes, I still am looking into making this data available, I just, yeah. I hope maybe in 2020 I will finally manage, hopefully earlier than later, because I think it would be very, very helpful for people to get access to this data for, for plugin authors specifically uh, more often than uh, um, uh, during every October non air. Yeah. Um, in any case, if you're a plugin author, if you're interested in how many installations are there or something, then hoopala, then um, I hope I'm not going to regret this, but uh, feel free to post in the in the uh, in the in the Octoprint community forum and just ask me there, uh, and then I'll just try to create an, uh, an uh, excerpt of this data and dump it there, so like a visualization, and then yeah, hopefully that will help. If it gets too much, I will have to say sorry. No, <laughs> we will stick to the bi-monthly uh, the, the per monthly thingies again. But yeah, just. So, you know, I'm open to help here uh, if I can. Okay, so um, that was basically all that for now I wanted to show you in the stats. And um, uh, <coughs> Jesus, sorry. <coughs> uh, uh, that brings me back to actually that brings me to the q a section let's do it like this um so uh, as i said there were four questions in the backlog and we're just going to go through them now and if there are any questions that come up or something in the uh, while i'm doing this uh, you can ask them in the live chat of course and i'll get you get to you then as soon as i see them or rather uh, when it fits so not when I'm right in the middle of my sentence, but you know. Um, okay, so uh, first question by Dan was, I have a leapfrog seed. I hope this is how it's pronounced. Is there a way to extract the level bed macro from the version of Octoprint or can you add it to available macros? I want to upgrade the Octoprint computer. So um, I have to admit, I have absolutely no idea about the leapfrog setup specifically there. I know they bundle. But um, I, I, I do not know where they, uh, where they put their, their bed leveling macro. So there are two possibilities that I see here. Uh, one is, as I, uh, is that as far as I remember, they went with a custom UI plugin to uh, co completely customize the front end. And it might be that they've put it in there. Um, or alternatively, maybe they've just de defined that stuff as a custom control, which is a core Octoprint feature. Um, in which case, yeah, you should be able to just check the config YAML. I'm assuming that you have access to the file system here, which I hope you do, because otherwise I have no idea <laughs> how to help you. But um, yeah, so just to check the config YAML uh, for, for the custom control definitions. And if there is nothing in there, then I would probably try to get my hands on the source of the custom UI and see if uh, something in there helps you. I do not want to put more or less printer specific bed leveling macros or any macros for that matter into Octoprint core because yeah, it just feels wrong. Uh, if it's printer specific, it belongs in a plugin maybe, but not in core. And also you can um, 
always customize the stuff yourself via the custom controls. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> I hope this helps. Um, I sadly no longer have contacts within Leapfrog, so I cannot investigate for you. I used to have some, but I, I no longer do. So, yeah. Next question by John. Uh, will 1.3x ever run on Python 3 or should we wait until 1.4x to try and rebuild a replicate based image to use Python 3 instead of 2? Uh, so no Python, uh, no Python, not, not Python, no Octoprint 1.3 will never run on Python 3 or at least not my versions. Um, all the all the Python uh, 3 conversion or compatibility stuff has been done on the devil branch. So on what will be 1.4.0 and ugh, something on my glasses. And um, so, yeah, so therefore I suggest you wait until 1.4 or maybe just take a look at what is there now and try to port things over now because then you will have them ready when uh, it gets released. Also about, about porting plugins and such, um, I put a post into the Octoprint community forums on this matter where I explained what to do and all that. And I've, I've, I still need to distill this into a blog post as well, we, also with a bit of an outline for people interested in this whole Python 3 stuff. Um, I, I simply have not yet found the time. Um, but you might want to take a look at that because it will hopefully help you a bit um, to to look uh, to know yeah what what the usual pitfalls are and also what you have to do with plugins in order for them to be even uh, able to load under Octoprint one for X running under Python three because there is a slight change that you'll need to make apart from testing if it even will work um, yeah so I hope this answers the question <clears throat> sorry this is mm. At least this time I was clever enough to prepare a mug of tea. Um, next question, also by John. Uh, what would you say is the more critical element to getting started as a community developer? I'd like to do the same type of jump you did, but going into firmware development for Redeem instead, and already there is one company indicating interest in putting dollars on the table for that, just not, not enough by itself. So this is really tricky to answer. Um, maybe even impossible so because I, I don't think there is a general answer to that. Um, so the the thing is, I think I can only tell you why I, why, what I think is why it so far works for me. I hope this suffices because I don't think that it's like generally transferable on every kind of open source development and trying to become a crowdfunded community developer. Um, I think why it worked for me was because at the point that I did this jump, which was in April, May, June, yeah, April, the, the Patreon went live in, in April, um, in April, 2016 is back then I already had an established user base that I basically could call to action and I did this. So I planned this, I knew that I had, I had lost my job, which so far was funding all this stuff like two weeks or three weeks before the Patreon went live and these two or three, two and a half, I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, basically I, I learned about it at the end of March and then until the April the 30th, uh, 13th, I uh, worked on making the press release ready, so to speak, uh, because what I wanted to do back then, and I think that is also important is to make clear so hey, here here's a problem re with regards to the future of this project but here is a solution so problem no more funding solution here's patreon please help me um of course that is very specific to my situation because i was already working full time on it but uh funded by a single sponsor and um yeah so that was like there would have been a huge shift in 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 in, in mode in in development mode if that had not worked out or basically it would have meant that i would have to stop doing it because i was was not and by the way i'm still not <laughs> ready uh, to do this kind of work as a pet project again because simply of the 
of the of the scale you know this is like this is a full-time job and then some and this is not something that i can do in my spare time or during my vacation or something like this at least not without it severely impacting my relationships and my health and uh, i went through this for almost two years was it two years well one and a half maybe for, all, for one and a half years I did this mode and I do not recommend it to anyone to do that long term. So yeah, this is something that I will not do. And um, being able to communicate this freely and having basically like critical enough mass, I guess you could say, to, to make this jump was crucial in order to do it. Uh, without that, I think, so without this critical mass, this would not have happened. Uh, I cannot tell you how big this critical mass was because back then I did not have any tracking yet. So I did not have any numbers of how many users were actually, or how many people were actually using Octoprint or rather how many instances were out there versus how many people then helped me. But yeah, at least it made a bit, 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 a bit of a splash back then um, in the new sphere. So apparently it rattled some people and that was, I think, very important to get the initial kickoff, so to speak. Um, then what I think also helped me was that I already had a proven track record of being to run this project first and foremost, and um, also run it well enough and stable enough that it was something that people like using, I guess. And uh, so I first, first on the site and then also full time. So. I, when I when I made this jump, I was at as I said at one and a half year of doing this as a pet project and almost two years, or even more than two years, no, almost two years, uh, of of doing it uh, full time and funded by a company by a single company, and um, so that was basically proof. I think for some people maybe that, hey, uh, she she doesn't just want to see if she can make that work, but she already did make that work and now only the money is the problem. So we can just throw money in the direction and then maybe the funding situation will clear itself and things will just continue to be like they are now. And I think that is basically what I did. So maybe that succeeded. Um, and one thing very, very important uh, I think is um, if you make this jump or if you want to make this jump, you have to be utterly prepared for it to fail. So um, at any given time, at the drop of a hat, basically, because um, what I do not have at all is control here. I mean, um, I get most of my uh, support through Patreon and also uh, yeah, through PayPal and a bit through Donorbox and now also GitHub sponsors is, is, is taking up a bit, but it's still very little uh, what, what comes in through there. Actually, I still haven't gotten my first payout because I'm still below $100 after I think two or three months. Um, but um, yeah, so all of this stuff are external services that are not under my control. So when something happens, like it did, for example, two years ago, almost, almost, uh, yeah, like one year and 11 months ago, almost to the day, uh, when Patreon decided to remodel their fee structure, which they then immediately rolled back on about three days later. But yeah, when they did that, I was hemorrhaging patrons left and right. And if they had stuck to this, it could have meant that all this, all this model would just stop working. Not because I did anything wrong or any, or, or because something even remotely in, inside my control changed, but simply, yeah, because some external factor made everything stop working. And you just have to be aware of that. So if you go this route, you do not have any kind of control over this. You have to be prepared for it to stop at any given moment. And people stopping to support you because of their financial situation or people stopping to support you because some other fancy project came around or stuff like this. So, uh, yeah. And in order to figure out if there is not a big, 
bang kind of failure, but a more of a lengthy failure is really, really, really important, at least from my experience so far, uh, to stay on top of your financial situation and monitor it very closely. So what I do every month is I, 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 I do full blown book bookkeeping of what comes in from where. I also have to do this for my tax uh, stuff anyhow, but um, I track this and I create trends and I analyze the shit out of that stuff in order to have an idea um, to have an idea are things still going up or at least stable or is it more like this because when it starts being like this then you have to see if you can somehow turn it back into this or at least this uh, but if you don't succeed with doing that you also have to have like a cut off period date thingy for yourself in mind when you stop trying to save a drowning uh, ship. Drowning ship ships don't drown, right? No, they go under. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, and yeah, just be prepared to do that. In my case, uh, if that were to happen, I would simply stop doing Octoprint because as I said, I cannot do this as a pet project anymore and would just look for regular employment again or maybe stay self-employed and do some fun Python stuff elsewhere remote or something i don't know i so far i have not had yet to look a bit more closely into this plan b but it exists and i have it in in mind and uh yeah so you should just be prepared of uh, prepared to have to face the situation and of course it would suck but yeah um thank you john a sinking ship yeah <laughs> english is not my native language <laughs> Also, it's late and Friday and I, I yeah, my throat and I, I just continue piling up the excuses here. Um, yeah, and uh, where was I? Right. Uh, and, and having the or facing the potential of failure here and keeping it in mind that it can happen and is completely outside of your control. Possibly. I mean, there are also things that you can do wrong that lead to failure here, but still. Um, is something that I would say is not only important for, or, or maybe is even less important for the success of the switch or of the jump, but rather it's very important for your own mental health and financial security. So um, yeah, that's what I would just suggest here. And other than that, I fear I do not really have any um, any kind of uh, advice because, as I said, it's very specific to my own situation. I think and. Uh, yours might be completely different. Your tax situation might be different. Maybe you have a clear tax situation because I don't. Um, yeah, so that was that. Um, and now uh, next question by uh, Ranjib. Um, as an open source software author, what is your biggest concern from a sustainability standpoint? So I actually have two and I just want to put, go on the record with that. This was also a really tough question that I had to think a bit about. Um, so as my lengthy answer to the to the previous uh, question might indicate is one thing that I think uh, is a really, really big, really, really big concern um, for sustainability in open source software development is uh, like the whole funding problem. Um, most open source software devs are severely underfunded. Uh, most open source software is severely underfunded. The devs are severely underfunded. Usually it's like two or three people developing everything in their free time. Um, in my case, it's one person developing it in her full time, which is uh, actually not that much better, I fear. Um, I mean, the funding is there, but the time is still not there, regardless. Um, and yeah, this simply does not scale past a certain point um, because people want to have a life. <laughs> they want to have families, they want to have friends, they want to have hobbies and all that. And if all your free time uh, goes into developing an open source project because you cannot afford doing it in your full time because you have to have a regular paying job in order to be able to afford doing the open source development work, then uh, yeah, things are simply not scaling. Um, and what I see is that with regards to, especially with regards to established libraries on the market. So I don't know, stuff like 
I can't think of an example, but like things that you use in order to build other software, but also with regards to existing um, um, applications is, uh, yeah, there are a lot of companies utilizing these to make profit. Uh, and yeah, those companies just need to realize that they need to give back. So, um, I mean, all this stuff is not being developed in a vacuum. It's people doing that and a lot of uh, volunteers doing that and uh, getting to a breaking point sometimes. And I think if companies did a bit more of the lifting that they should be doing, considering that they are profiteering of these things or profiting, profiteering, whatever, um, they, they should give back and they either should do it back through patches, like also fixing fixing bugs and stuff, not just fixing them on site and then not giving them back, but like being part of the community of the tool or of the library that they are using. And of course, also giving back monetarily, uh, because as I said, the goal should be to make, to allow people who are crucial to a project to actually work on this project in a funded kind of way and not forcing them to do it as a hobby because at one point they might just decide it's not worth it anymore for them or they just want another hobby for which they don't have time if they already develop stuff so um yeah that is something that i think should be in the best interest of every single company out there utilizing open source software one way or the another to make a dime on. And for some reason, it rarely happens. There has been a bit of an uptick recently, thanks to solutions like, so there's something out there called Tidelift, where you can register, I think as an open source project, and then companies can register and say which open source projects they use, and then give money to them through that avenue. And that is a nice idea. Uh, the problem is that it's uh, mostly targeting um, libraries, uh, so again, stuff that I, other people use in order to build more stuff on and Octoprint is not something that fits there. So end user, Octo, end user applications, which are usually used as is, which maybe get enhanced by plugins, but like you have this basic platform that you, you do not build something on Octoprint per se. You, you do not put in Octoprint as a dependency, um, but instead run it somewhere. So that is the difference here. And the problem with end user application is, uh, first of all, there is a bit of a vacuum there with regards to solutions for how to fund these, uh, because you cannot just analyze dependency graphs or something like that and then see, ah, okay, low dash gets so, uh, such and such, uh, uh, amount, uh, such and such an amount and, and requests get, gets this other, uh, um, amount because yeah, you, it simply has to rely on the on the users to actually say, oh yeah, I like this and I want to see this improve and uh, get bug fixes and all that stuff. So maybe I should help fund it. And yeah, there is a bit of a vacuum there, as I said. And Patreon and PayPal and such can work, but yeah, they are not near, not really. They are not specifically built for this kind of stuff. And especially Patreon has this huge focus on artists and some so musicians, writers. Uh, comic authors, stuff like that. And every time that I get an update from them, I feel a bit like I'm the, the black sheep in the family, so to speak, because you're, Hey, I'm, I'm the creative mind that makes software. I just feel like I don't really fit in. And, uh, yeah, so this is something that you have to keep in mind there. Um, so yeah, long story short, uh, funding is, I think a big, big, big issue for open source sustainability. And the other that I see personally is um, entitlement. Um, there's a lot of open source users out there, and that applies both to end users and also to developers using libraries who, for some reason, forget that the software or the library or whatever they are using is made by people and not some faceless company. Um, so I think what I can say here is that all software, uh, all open source maintainers, myself included, we do our best, uh, best that is possible that we can do. Uh, we want to keep our stuff bug free. We want to keep it stable. We want to make it work for everyone. 
And if we don't want to make it work for something, we are at least open to find a solution that makes everyone happy. And uh, all of this depends, however, on the collaboration of the people who are using our stuff. And if those people view us as the enemy who needs to somehow be screamed at or uh, ridiculed or uh, just withholding inf gets 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 information withheld uh, like log files and version numbers and such um yeah this is simply not going to work what i notice a lot is there are basically two groups of or three groups let's make it three groups of no there are two groups there are two groups of users of octoprint one group is people who are um enthusiastic to help me help them so they have a problem, uh, maybe it's a bug, maybe it's just a case of user error or something that is unclear on the UI and they do not know what to do, or maybe their printer is weird. Things like this can happen. And then uh, some users are like, okay, I have this problem. What do you need from me in order to help you help me? And then I tell them and then they give that to me and then we have this very positive a collaboration on something like this and in the end everyone thanks everyone else and everyone is happy and the problem is solved or at least it is analyzed enough that next steps can be done for example by flashing a, a proper firmware on the printer and not something that someone wrote who doesn't know how firmware is supposed to work um, and then there's the other group which is smaller but sadly very very loud and that is the group that goes on to open tickets that basically go Either I have a problem, yes, elaborate please, and then you have to try to pull every single bit of information out of their nose uh, with, a, with pliers and it is really, really, really tiring and frustrating. Um, and uh, sometimes it gets even worse than that and they start to say things like, who no one tested this shit and stuff like that and this is like the really negative stuff um where yeah the kind of toxic behavior that can really burn out a maintainer and makes uh running an open source project uh sometimes entirely impossible to stomach so i do not know if i ever showed you this but let's try something i hope this does not get too shaky but for this specific group, I have something in my office, my punching bag, and that has helped my mental health tremendously. But personally, I think it would be better if not every open source maintainer needed a punching bag in their office, but instead people would maybe, yeah, remember the human on the other hand, uh, on the other end and uh, um, make it more sustainable mentally for an open source maintainer to do their job by not treating them like a, like their personal slave or uh, withholding information they need in order to help them and such. Um, and from what I've seen is that usually an open source maintainer starts very enthusiastically like, hey, I have made this this, 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 this tool here or this, this library or this plugin or this application or whatever and I want to share it with everyone and, and I think it's great and maybe it helps someone and then people start like could you make it do that and could you make it do that and they are like yes 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 I'm doing all of this and then the more it grows the more likely it is that they encounter one of these uh, they encounter one of these people that I mentioned that are really really nasty and that then can be really a bit of a bummer and some people then simply stop some people soldier on through and then it gets worse then they start finding themselves for weeks and weeks and weeks running after log files and all that and then two uh, one of two things can happen either the people at one point say i'm done i'm not doing this anymore i merely started this in order to solve a problem that i was having and if i thought maybe someone was going to um I, I was going to help someone else by by publishing this as well but i i simply cannot i do not want or i cannot run after after things or the other option is the maintainer uh, goes becomes a bit of a grumpy mess so these are the two extremes there are of course a lot of variations in between 
um, which is usually the point where uh, people maintainers are like like no locks booth closed and like really grumpy and i i have to admit i've also done this in the past because um yeah it just gets too much <laughs> um and i try to to rein it in but sometimes it still comes through so less though ever since i got the punching bag and um yeah it, it would be i i think it would be such a nicer world if uh we did not have this particular problem that much or also if you see something say something if you see some uh, sorry for the word, but if you see some asshole abusing a maintainer, then just speak up. Because that is also something that I've noticed helped me a lot dealing with these people. When I saw someone being really, really aggressive towards me and calling me names and all that. And it, it helped so much when someone else just said, um, what you're doing here, not okay. Don't get nasty about it. Stay professional, stay clean, but just speak up and say your behavior here is absolutely out of anything that is tolerable. Yeah, it's actually something that everyone could do, I think. Yeah. And that just got a bit philosophical. Also, I hope uh, the you don't hear that. Um, and if you do, I'm sorry for that. There is a church like, I don't know, maybe 150 meters or something like that uh, as the bird flies and yeah it just decided to start ringing the bells because i don't know for what reason or ever well okay i hope that answered the question i mean it's just my perspective uh but yeah i hope i gave it um and now let's take a look at the live chat if there's something Ah, uh, John asked whether I print out the usernames and tape them on the punching bag. So far, I haven't. Uh, what I usually do is if something really infuriates me and I read that, I just immediately jump up. Usually I have music running here anyhow now, um, uh, but right now I obviously don't because recording and all that. But usually I have something with a lot of uh, beats going on anyhow, and then I just put on my grappling uh, um, uh, gloves and pound this thing for a bit. And then once I'm winded, I'm usually also calmed down again. Um, it, I, I really cannot stress enough how big of a difference this thing has made for my, how do I say, my inner balance, basically. Because yeah, before it was, when someone was being an ass, it was, it, it sometimes it churned and churned and churned in my head for a day or maybe longer, depending on the ex excessiveness of the, behavior and now it's usually done and over after 15 minutes or so thanks to that thing so i really can recommend this investment <laughs> um ah yeah uh the uh, john another john <laughs> has a silly question or that's that's his his phrase i would just say a question uh what is that wheel at the bottom right of the picture so i figure you're talking about that one well, let me make this yeah so um i mentioned that i'm going to chaos communication congress right um the thing is that thing is at leipzig fair i was there two years ago already and uh what i did back then was i walked a whole ton uh because that thing is big and congress is big and I was really, really envious of all the people having a scooter back then. So what I did was I bought myself a scooter. Now is the question, why is there a scooter in my room propped up like it was a car that I'm working on? Well, the scooter is not going to stay like it, like it was when I bought it. Uh, so um, let me just maybe... Uh, so what I did is uh, a bit tricky to hold i hope you can see that yeah uh what i did is so these are two uh rgb uh ws 2a 12 led strips and this is an esp32 and this down here is a usb battery pack uh mounted in a printed designed and printed uh thingy and uh what it currently does when plugged in is a little fire effect as an underglow basically 
and uh, that's only the start though um, I finally got all the parts in this week uh, what I want to do is make these um, uh, make these light effects uh, sound reactive and uh, I also got a little OLED display that I want to use for uh, switching the effects and all that because the, the Wi-Fi of the ESP will be switched off while I'm at the event uh, rogue APs are not very, very welcome there and um, I also don't want to put it on the regular Wi-Fi because then yeah I mean it's a hacker event I don't want people to hack my scooter and um, plus it's not really necessary anyhow if I have an OLED display and I want to have this OLED display anyhow because what I also bought was a couple of read switches and all that so that thing is going to get a speedometer um, and uh, yeah, I got some other ideas. <laughs> not, I don't want to promise too much now, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm. This is basically like my current pet project for after hours when I, when if if when I still have the energy to work on it. Also, when I get when I actually have the parts that I need. But as I said, at least now I think everyone everything should be there at least for the current ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I hope that answers the question. And uh, yeah, do we have anything else? Nope, I don't think so. Oh, something about the the one three ten um, uh, printers that are still out there. Jo John uh, speculated that it might be some print farm uh, or two. Maybe Prusa. Uh, I, I think Prusa isn't using Octoprint. Um, but yeah, maybe it's a print farm. I don't know. I mean, it's... How many was it again? Still around... 4,000? 3,000? 3,500? Something like that. So... Yeah, I have no idea. I just hope at one point they will update. <laughs> Uh, simply because then I will not get these weird spikes in my printed hour graph anymore. But if push comes to shove, I will just um, find some way to filter those out, I hope. Yep. Okay. So that was that. Uh, no more questions, I think. Uh, so the next one will be roughly in a month again. I'll, ma I'll try to make it before Christmas, of course. Huh? As the last one in 2019. Um might be able to give you an update on the scooter then as well <laughs> and uh we'll post the appointment on patreon as always i will try to see that i get this recording out next week but uh yeah i hope it actually works out last time it was a bit delayed due to uh, 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 yeah. um and uh with that being said um yeah what i'm now going to do is probably make dinner and uh start playing the witcher 3 which i ordered which came today for switch again and um yeah until next time then all that's left to say is uh, thanks for being here i hope it was interesting and you learned something and got your questions answered and all that and uh yeah um in any case uh happy printing bye <laughs>